Our speaker today is Dr. Danny Caballero from Michigan State University. He was an undergraduate at UT, so he was from Texas originally. Mm -hmm. And then he went to Georgia Tech, right? So you're right. He was a graduate student at Georgia Tech with a physics education research degree in the physics department. Okay? Which is important to us here. Um, and so then he did a postdoc in Colorado in their physics education research group, and now he's at Michigan State. Um, anything else I should add? Uh, we get the tie because we're not physics, we're education, so we get the formal. That is true. Right? You do get so the tie. So he would be, <laughs> look really unkempt if we were talking to physics, so we, we are much broader and we get the tie. <laughs> you get less hobo uniform. <laughs> All right. Thank you, so, Folks, thanks for coming. Um, uh, apologize for the washed out nature of the, the slides. I'll make sure to send them to the best so that she can send them out. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work we've been doing over the last few years on trying to support the integration of computing or computation into physics courses. Um, and before I do that, though, I want to just acknowledge the group that I get to work with um, because a lot of the work that gets done is not work that I do myself, certainly. Uh, it's work that's done by a lot of different folks, and um, my job here is to sort of try to represent their work as best I can as opposed to sort of taking credit for it. Um, but Vashti and I co-direct this group um, of uh, grad students and undergrads and postdocs and so forth, and, and, uh, and some people gave us money to do stuff. <laughs> um, so a computer is a big part of science. Uh, it's done a lot of different things for science. And so the first thing I want to do is just talk a little bit about what's done in physics. I think, you know, these are some high-level things that people are probably familiar with. Uh, so not too long ago, um, this, is a, this is a picture uh, from the uh, CERN uh, conference room. Um, so this is the big high-energy experiment that happens in uh, Switzerland. Um, and this fellow right here with his hand up, you can barely see. Uh, this is the director of CERN, and he's, he's real excited, and so is everybody else in this picture. Uh, and they're really excited about this graph, which doesn't really look like much. Uh, but they're excited specifically about this part of it, which is the detection of the Higgs boson, which is what helps us understand um, how mass comes to be. Right? Now, the thing I want you to take away from this is not so much that we found the Higgs, but we did. That's great. Uh, is really that uh, this is an incredible experimental and computational endeavor. Uh, the amount of data analysis necessary to find these events and to find enough of these events to be able to put some uh, error bars on this, basically five sigma error, which is you know one one um, um, sort of five times uh, 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 extreme. Uh, 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 yeah. Thank you very much. Yes. High energy physicists. <laughs> appreciate it. Yes, yeah, something like 99.99 and a bunch of other stuff, and then at some point somebody truncates it, right? Um, point being here that uh, the amount of data that's necessary to dig through this is incredible. Uh, I believe I had heard at some point that in any one of these collision experiments, something like 7 or 8 million DVDs worth of data is generated. Uh, and that's just an incredible amount. Um, I'll we'll go a little farther here. Uh, there's, some, there's some other work that's been done recently. Uh, this is the uh, New York Times article describing the uh, ring down of two black holes that were sort of orbiting each other. Right? This is a, a, a really nice uh, cap on a sort of 110 year theory of, of uh, gravitational waves. Um, the data that people were looking at was this here. Um, so this is the data from Livingston and Hanford uh, showing this black hole merger ring down, which is uh, the sort of oscillation in the strain. Again, it's kind of hard to see uh, here. Uh, what's really interesting is actually recently um, we've seen this not just happen with black holes, but actually seen it happen with neutron stars. And that's really nice because you actually get light. And so you get to see not just what happens gravitationally, but also what can happen uh, in the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, in any event, uh, one thing I like to tell people about, especially people who maybe not haven't seen this before, that strain measurement uh, has a 10 to the minus 21 on it. That is a measure that is the width of your thumb in a distance between here and I believe the next closest galaxy. That's the detection level that we're talking about here. Right, so again, this is an incredible experimental endeavor, but also an incredible computational endeavor to sort of unpack this 
clean this data and fit it. So um, here's a stool. Uh, this stool is meant to sort of represent the way that we're doing science now. Uh, this is a metaphor, um, it's not the best metaphor, uh, because there's a lot of theoretical and experimental work that goes into doing computation. Um, but if you think about it in terms of different ways in which people might approach doing science, you know, there are these three parts of it, and representing those three parts is important. So, um, in sort of thinking about that and sort of reflecting on it a little bit, we could ask the question, well, what's changed in physics education? Right? Um, and we can think about that over a very long period of time. Um, let me start here. Uh, so this is uh, the sort of complete theory of classical electromagnetism. These are Maxwell's equations. Um, they describe our understanding, at least at the time, of how electromagnetic radiation works, uh, how electromagnetic fields interact with each other, what their sources do. Uh, it turns out they're also consistent with special theory of relativity, uh, which is kind of an upshot. You go and you look at a textbook that was written around that time, and you have this. Um, so this is an Atlas machine, for folks who don't know. It's basically two masses attached by a string around a pulley, and the game is to figure out how fast one of them moves, uh, what the acceleration is, what the motion looks like, whatever, whatever you want. Right? There's a lot of different analysis. Now, this seems like it probably, at the time, was pretty important, I suppose, because you had to move like hay bales and stuff. That, I guess. Farmers? I do. It seems important. I can imagine it being important at the time. Alright, so let's go forward a little bit, right? So, turn of the century, we have the development of the special theory of relativity. Um, we have the observation of the photoelectric effect and also sort of its explanation. So, we have the developments of sort of modern physics starting. And we go look at a textbook, and there's a picture of an Atlas machine. It's significantly more detailed now, which I guess is important. This is actually from a German military manual uh, written at the time. I'm not sure what the German military necessarily needed with Atlas machines, but uh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> All right, so we'll go a little farther forward. Right here's radar. Uh, this is in the 50s and 60s. It's also the development of the laser, which is sort of the introduction of condensed matter physics. Um, these have been very important uh, for us going forward, especially with applied electronics and so forth. Um, we can look at a textbook at that time, and we have an Atlas machine with numbers now so we can make calculations, which is pretty <coughs> helpful as well. Uh, all right, a little farther forward, uh, development of nuclear power, nuclear physics is really important. Um, we also have the development of the personal computer. This is actually revolutionizing science at this point because we can have these inexpensive devices actually in libraries and in science laboratories and in publishers' offices to draw Atlas machines. <laughs> <laughs> So this is when I was in college. Uh, so this is supposed to be a map of the internet. Um, so this is all the sort of interconnected networks uh, at some time. Um, we also have these devices now, right? So you have the whole of human knowledge uh, in your pocket, essentially. Um, and so we can now have Atlas machines that are in color. <laughs> <laughs> so the point being is that like, we've had these incredible changes to physics specifically, and I think this is true of a lot of disciplines, um, and we've had these incredible changes to technology, and yet the canon of our, of our curriculum has stayed very similar, right? It stayed very, very similar. We decided at some point this is what it was going to look like, and it has continued to look like that. Um, and I think even physics majors courses, I teach the majors courses now, and I, at some point in the 1950s we decided this was what a major sequence looks like, and that is what it continues to look like. Um, and so my argument is that we have to think about that a little bit because the, the world that our students are encountering is increasingly technologically enabled. It's also increasingly data driven and, and, and data rich. And so we should think about how that's going to work. Um, but, okay, that was a little tongue in cheek, but the, the idea is that there has been some real changes in physics education um, that I have been able to be a part of um, and others as well. So here's a picture of all of the institutions that claim to have physics education research groups or faculty uh, across the US and in Mexico, uh, including Michigan State and Texas Tech. Um, and this is a field that sort of developed um, out of a, sort of a variety of ways, but, but mostly in the 70s and 80s and has sort of risen a lot over the last decade or so. 
Um, and for those folks who maybe are not as familiar with it, um, we study a lot of different things in physics education research. Uh, how students learn, how they engage with stuff, what kind of pedagogy and curricula um, sort of impact their learning and what ways it does. So these are probably the central things I think that a lot of uh, physicists and probably scientists think about when they think about discipline-based education research is what we do. But we do a lot of other stuff too. We try to understand how students are recruited into majors, how they are supported and retained in those majors. Uh, we study issues of diversity and inclusivity in physics and in science. Um, how faculty engage in their teaching practice, how they make decisions about what they're going to do around that and so forth. What department culture and climate actually looks like. And more broadly, what the national landscape surrounding physics education is. Um, and so when you start to think about you know, all of the different things that we're looking at, it's a lot of things. And it's a lot of different scales. Um, and if you're going to try to start making some changes, you're trying to start, to start making some big changes, is what I'm kind of arguing for, um, looking at all of these things is important uh, in, in different ways. Um, so I'll just give you a very quick history lesson on physics education research. So, it's might be hard to see, but uh, this is how physics was taught when I was an undergrad. Um, uh, with a bunch of people sitting in chairs, listening patiently to a lot of stuff written on the board, um, with one person sort of standing there. Um, this is actually a uh, screen capture from A Serious Man, which is a dark comedy in which this guy's life falls apart. He's a physics professor with his life falling apart. It's, it hits a little close to home, but it's, <laughs> it's a pretty good movie. Um, but the point being is that uh, when, you, when this has been uh, a set of studies that have been done a lot, where people look at how those lecture courses impact student learning. And what they find is that students often develop an understanding of around you know, 20 to 25 percent of the stuff that they didn't already know coming in, and it's sort of the basic stuff. And you know, there's a lot of problems with this plot. We don't need to dig into that. I'm just sort of giving you a sense of what this actually might look like. We've moved towards these kinds of environments. I've seen some of these environments here um, that took me around. We are moving towards these environments at Michigan State. These are these sort of interactive environments where students are centered around the table, they have equipment, they're discussing with each other, they're dealing with sort of big problems and so forth. And we find that students tend to learn a bit more in those kinds of uh, environments. Um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a big sort of dispersion here, right? We can talk about that if we need to, but we don't, I don't think we have to. Um, but what we find is that this is actually something that can be replicated in a lot of different disciplines, not just physics, it shows up in chemistry and in biology and in engineering and math education and so forth. And so the point being is that we've spent a lot of time in physics education research looking at those kinds of environments, looking at what I would say are sort of traditional assessments of student learning and showing that it is pretty robust, um, but also sort of impacting what I would say are really only the two legs of the stool on the left-hand side. Students sort of conceptual or theoretical understanding, problem-solving understanding, and students' experimental understanding, how they work with experimental techniques and so forth. And we haven't really spent a lot of time with the other, the other leg. Right? How does that computational approach to physics help us, ha help students develop a deeper understanding of physics and also a deeper understanding of how physics is actually done? Um, so, sorry. Um, because I would argue, um, as somebody who was formerly a computational nonlinear dynamicist prior to switching, um, a physics education requires a computational education. I think I broadened that out a little bit to say a science education, in principle, uh, should require a computational education. Um, and here's a couple of reasons why. So here's a picture of uh, a quantum mechanics formula sheet. Um, it probably looks like a lot of formula sheets that you might have used in your own courses, right? Uh, all of the equations are written down. They're sectioned off, so you know when to use certain ones and which ones go together, right? And the game is, I ask you a question, you find the section, you write down the equation, maybe plug in some things and work through it, right? And this is unfortunate because um, a lot of times this is what students leave courses with thinking physics is. It's a collection of equations that are applied at the right time to get the right answer. And there's a lot of thinking that goes on to the development of these equations, of these models, as I would call them, right, as a way of understanding the sort of underlying physical system, the assumptions that go into it, how they're applied, what meaning you can make of them, and so forth. And I'm not saying that computation is 
sort of a silver bullet that's going to fix all of this, but rather it's one way of enabling sort of an understanding that maybe is a little bit different than this finding the right equation and putting it in. So, um, for example, visualization is pretty useful. Um, so this is, these are two um, simulations of uh, um, particles in a box. So one is in a particle in a, in a square box. Uh, the other one is a particle in a harmonic well. So this is the, the wave function or the, the, the probability distribution and how it evolves with time, right? And so getting a sense of how that spreads out or how it moves around gives you a sense of, you know, what you can expect to see in this kind of system. The other thing is that when you approach problems computationally, you, you can start to develop what are what I would think of as general problem solving strategies for a broad set of problems, right? So here's a one dimensional um, differential equation where I haven't specified what A and B are, but depending on my choice of A and B, uh, it could be a model for a buckling beam, it could be a model for the electric potential between two plates, it could be the model for a square well, it could be a model for diffusion, right? And the idea is that the approach to solving that problem is no different computationally, regardless of the choice of A and B. And it gives you a sense of all of these models, all of these phenomena sort of have the same kind of model with different sort of assumptions and, and variables and so forth. In physics specifically, um, there's a lot of data that's being taken by the American Institute of Physics. I don't know that other um, professional organizations have this kind of branch, um, but AIP, collects data on physics undergraduates, graduates, people that are working with physics degrees, and so forth. And what they find is that about 50% of bachelor's graduates in physics go off to graduate study, usually in engineering, physics, astronomy, um, computer science, you know, some form of STEM, usually. But about half of them go straight into the workforce. And when they survey those folks on what they're actually doing in the workforce, it turns out that most of them are going into STEM jobs, and most of those STEM jobs consist of doing data analysis and programming and, and modeling and so forth, right? So the vast majority of students in bachelor's degree programs in physics would be well served by having these experiences with computation. It prepares them both for graduate school where they're doing cutting edge research, but also for the jobs that they're, they're going to be going into and they're going to be expected to have some experience with. So, right. Um, so this seems like it's kind of important, right? It seems like it's something that we should be thinking about in physics, and I, can, I would argue that you know, maybe thinking about it in, in broader science is important as well. Um, but it turns out that it's a really hard problem to solve, right? Uh, there's a lot of inertia uh, associated with it, but there's also a lot of layers. Um, so I work at a college um, you know, within some university, but I also work within a physics department. And within that department, my department offers courses and those courses have class meetings. Those class meetings have activities that we engage in. And there's some specific tasks within those activities that students have to do, right? And um, all of these layers, uh, these sort of different frames of understanding what I'm actually working in or what anyone is actually working in, right? um, all need to be studied. They all are going to be impacted if this change is happening, right? What my department expects, what my college expects, might dictate how I teach my courses, what specific courses are offered and how they're offered might change how I structure things, what my students are prepared for might tell me what tasks I engage with, right? So I mean, like all of these things, all of these different layers are important, and they're, they're all important to study to understand how we would actually make these changes. And I, I would argue that this is a, this is a uh, sort of way of thinking about change in general when you're thinking about what you're going to do, but it's also important when it's sort of a big change. So. Uh, our group studies a lot of different things. I'm just going to kind of put these up here because they actually just sort of mirror that same framing, right? So things like what's the national landscape surrounding computational integration in physics courses? I'll tell you a little bit about that today. How faculty come into the community of those who teach it? You know, how do you design courses? What kind of understanding do students develop when they're doing computing? What kind of knowledge and strategies do students use when they're doing stuff? How do they understand a specific line of code, which turns out to be the one that's necessary for the method of relaxation? Right? So these are all different sort of layers that sort of fit with that same idea. Um, and we study all of these different things. I only have time to kind of show you something at the sort of like smallest level and then the sort of highest level. Okay. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about Georgia Tech. Uh, Georgia Tech is a big engineering university in the South. Um, it has a large number of students from the state of Georgia, but it also has students that come from across the country and across the world. 
Um, I think it's 87% of the students that are going to Georgia Tech are engineering majors. Uh, it is an engineering school. Um, the other 13% are science majors, and there is one or two people that are majoring in the College of Liberal Arts. Like literally one or two people that are majoring in the College of Liberal Arts that exists for some reason. I think because we have to, we had to offer writing courses, and so they needed a college associated with that. I'm not sure. Um, but it's actually, it's liberal arts with technology. It's very interesting. They do a lot of science fiction. They're very nerdy there. <laughs> very nerdy. Um, so we taught a physics course there that integrated computation. Um, and what it did is it used Python to model physical systems. So this is a, this is a, 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 a Python model of a gravitational orbit. And that will be mostly the example I, I use actually throughout the talk. Um, so this is just a few lines that sets up a program that students would work with. Um, so what it does is it prepares sort of the Earth and the satellite, and the, and the student runs the code. Uh, the Earth, or sorry, the satellite moves directly by the Earth without interacting with it. Okay. Um, we call this a minimally working program. It actually comes from Sean Weatherford's PhD thesis, who was at North Carolina State. Um, it's a way of scaffolding uh, the computation into an introductory course where students have absolutely no experience doing computing. So only about 10% of students at Georgia Tech, maybe 15%, had some experience with computing in this way. Right? They had, they could write uh, HTML code or they could you know, use Excel or things like that, but this kind of programming knowledge, only about 10 or 15% had that experience. Um, so what we would do is we'd give them that code, and I'm sorry, this is going to be really hard to see. Um, but the students are going back and forth between the visualization and the code, and they're updating it. And you'll not be able to see this at all. But there's basically the orbit starts to happen. They start to figure out like how they're getting that interaction to work, and then it, it begins to orbit properly. But they spend a lot of time going back and forth and discussing with each other. And ultimately, what they're doing is they are making changes to the green boxes, which are the sort of initial conditions and model parameters, things like the initial position, the initial velocity, masses, and so forth. And then they're adding the, um, I don't think that's purple, but it's whatever that color is, boxes, um, which are actually the calculation of the force, the uh, integration step, which is how you predict the momentum in the next step, and so forth. They're also adding some motion maps, which are like stroboscopic images, so like images taken at equal time intervals and some graphs and stuff like that. They spend about two hours going from the previous code to this code, which is, which is changing five lines um, adding, you know, two lines and like looking up the other ones that they need to add. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of their sort of mental effort to do that. Um, now, at Georgia Tech, what we did is we had them do this kind of activity about 10 or 11 times over the course of the semester in mechanics. They would also take this code and they would solve homework problems with it. So we'd ask them to make some changes to it and model some new systems. Over time, we were able to actually give them, let me go back real quick. We were able to give them minimally working programs that modeled systems that they hadn't yet studied, and they would fill in this part themselves to model those new systems as homework, not in the laboratory, which is what they were doing early in the semester. So what we wanted to do was figure out, well, can they do this on their own? Um, and what kinds of things did they run into when they tried to do it on their own? So what we gave them at the end of the semester was a program that was very similar to the one that we'd given them in the past. Um, it was a central force problem, but it was not a spring force problem or a gravitational force. It was a general sort of uh, central force problem. They had to assign the initial conditions, which they had already done a lot, and they had to write the code that models the system, write the force down, the integration step, and so forth. Um, this was done with about 1,300 students per semester, because that's how many students take introductory mechanics at Georgia Tech. It's an enormous number of students. Um, and what we found was that about 60% of the students could successfully model that system on their own in sort of a proctored environment, um, which is nice. It tells us that you know there's a fair fraction of students that are learning how to do the thing that we want them to do, but there's still quite a few of them that had one or more mistakes. Now, how we knew this was essentially we asked them to turn in their code, but they also had to answer some numeric questions about what their code was predicting at the end of the day. And we could check that against what we found it to be. Um, so that's where these goals come in. The interesting part about this is actually digging into those errors to see what kinds of mistakes did they make? What was common about those mistakes? 
So what we did was we developed a rubric to look at all of the erroneous code. So we downloaded all of their code, looked at all of their code, came up with a rubric, and then scored all the students on those kinds of mistakes. So these mistakes would be things like the sign of the force is wrong, or the force appears outside of the loop, or the force is calculated as a magnitude, or you know things like that, right? So the common kinds of things that we would see, we went through and we coded in pairs blindly, and then looked at like what the overlap was, and it was pretty good. It was about 91%, which is pretty high for, for a rubric. Uh, turns out that there's exactly 107 different ways that students could go wrong in this, um, in this data anyway. And so what we used was a technique called cluster analysis to look at whether there was a, a similarity between the kinds of mistakes that we saw. And it turns out that there was. There was actually a lot of similarity. So 80% of the students with erroneous code appeared in just five clusters. The biggest error that students make was they would have a sign error in their calculation of the force. They just flip the sign. Instead of being attractive, it was repulsive. Their code would blow up, and they turned it in anyway. Um, about 20% of students just had an error in the initial conditions. So instead of like the velocity is 0.48, they'd write 0.84. It would run without error, they'd turn it in, everything looks good except for that small mistake. So in fact, that number I showed you, 60%, is actually quite a bit higher. There's, there's quite a few students that were able to do that. These two are very interesting because both of these actually have to do with students' understanding of uh, math, physics, and, and in particular vectors. Um, treating the net force as a scalar. Python tells you you're being naughty, but if you can't parse that error, then you just give up and you turn it in, that's fine. Um, raising a separation vector to a power, so taking something like A as a vector and raising it squared or raising it cubed, like Python tells you you're being naughty, it can't do that operation, but if, you don't, if you're don't, if you not able to sort of debug what it's saying, then maybe you just turn it in, right? Um, the last one is the force is calculated outside the loop. That's essentially treating it as a constant force because it's calculated once and then it gets used a bunch of times. Um, what we argued in this paper initially was that the, the dominant errors that we saw, we didn't think were syntactic errors, meaning that they weren't errors of syntax, right? Errors where students are writing the code. Um, I think now I, I'd like to walk that back a bit um, because I don't think that you can actually extract the syntactic errors from the physics errors or from the math errors. Because I actually think what we were doing was we were asking students to bring in their mathematics knowledge, their physics knowledge, and their computing knowledge, and doing the work that we were asking them to do some, sits somewhere in the middle. Right? So knowing that I can't take a vector to a power is something I might know, but when I'm doing it in the context of computing, maybe I don't realize that that's what I'm being told and I don't really activate that knowledge and I don't use it. Right? So instead I, I do something else. Right? So um, this is just kind of interesting for us to think about because we're interested in sort of that intersection there now when it comes to student understanding. All right, uh, so I went to Boulder for a while. We can talk about that. But now I'm in East Lansing, which is beautiful also. Um, this is the Thai Hut. Uh, it has since been torn down. These are pieces of plywood over the door. Uh, uh, is yeah. that when it's torn down or before it's torn down? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, it, it was like that for 10 years uh, before it got torn down, um, which is awesome. Uh, this is what it looks like when you turn around, though. So this is each one. This is, this is the Beaumont Tower. It's actually quite beautiful. Uh, and we also have mountains in Michigan that I haven't seen. I think it's a generous definition of the word mountain, though. Um, they're like kind of rolling things. Anyway. So at, at, uh, at State, what we're starting to do is we're actually trying to unpack um, how students approach these computational problems, right? So not just that they're doing this stuff, but actually how do they go about doing it? And so we had to create a course to do this, and I can talk to you later about that, about specifically about the course that we designed. Um, so this is a course that has computation. It's an introductory course in, for science and engineering students. Uh, it's flipped in the sense that students do stuff outside of the class and then they do all of their work in small groups uh, in the class. Uh, it's problem based in that when they're doing the computing part of it, they're focused on a task. Um, so it's not just like solve this problem, but rather like you've been hired by an engineering firm to do this. You know, there's some context there, for sure. Um, this is the kind of problem that students would engage with. So this is, a, this is a problem that they would do on the first day of class, and this is a problem that they would do on the second day of class. I should say that uh, there's no laboratory associated with this course. Um, that is something that is just 
uh, part of state's history. We, we have separate lecture and laboratory courses. Um, so the first problem that they would work on together on uh, the first day of class, they would try to put a satellite into orbit by basically modeling the motion analytically, so figuring out the velocity and the position and arguing why that is the case and how they know it's the case, why the mass of the satellite doesn't matter, which is actually kind of interesting and they don't realize it first and so forth. That allows them to get the sort of conditions that they need to then model the system computationally with the code I actually showed you from Georgia Tech, right? This is, we use exactly the same code, in fact. So we give them that piece of code, um, and then they use the stuff that they did on the first day to solve the problem on the second day. Uh, I should also say that this, the number of students, again, with some sort of computing experience or programming experience is about the same. It's still about 10 to 15 percent. Um, so. Uh, so Mike Obzniak, one of my PhD students, is working on what students do when their code doesn't work. Um, and this involves him doing some live observations. Yes, sorry. Sorry for the interruption. No, no, please. Is that, uh, is that determined by pre-course surveys? How do you determine the Yes, it is determined by pre-course surveys. Okay. Yeah, so we give them a set of things, like here are the things that um, you might have done with computers before. What we don't tell them is some of those things we count as programming or computing, and some of those things are just doing things, right? Okay. So it's like making a PowerPoint presentation, using a spreadsheet, um, writing a web page from scratch, um, you know, writing a computer program. So we just have all of those things, and then we look at the ones that actually have the things that are kind of like what we would expect them to do. Yeah. James, is that a lower number than it was in the 90s? Because that seems really low for the kinds of schools you're talking about. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether it's lower or not. Um, it's, it, I, I think it's mainly a function of like what we're actually asking them specifically that we expect them to, to have. Um, because I think a lot of a lot of students now report that they have like experience with software like Excel or whatever, or experience writing, you know, HTML code from scratch. Um, but not a lot of students are reporting like writing a computer program or doing a, compu a computer project or something. I don't remember how to word it. Um, uh, I, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, it is higher. We we have we had some students at some point join in a, like as an honor section. And it was much higher there. It was like 75 percent. So, um, so in, a, in the general science and engineering track for the state, it seems to be closer to 15. Okay. Uh, this is the same piece of code I showed you earlier. Students were doing exactly the same thing. Um, it's just a different instructional design. So they do all this work together, and they negotiate it together in a classroom, and they produce code that looks like what I showed you earlier. Um, what I'm going to show you now is actually what happens when they do it. So this is actually a little classroom video that Mike has analyzed. And I hope you can hear it. Um, I, I have my <coughs> volume turned all the way up. So right now this group, which you really can't see at all, uh, but the video is captured, uh, finds a bug in their code. Uh, the, like, oh, okay. the problem is that like, we can't get it. Like, they shouldn't, there's no good reason for people to be in this direction in the first place. Like, so the, the problem like, is not so much that it's not doing what we want as it is that like we don't know why it's not doing what we want. <laughs> Yeah, so what happens is the, the, the uh, so the reason it's blacked out here is because this student didn't sign the consent form to have their video <laughs> shown, um, but he did sign the consent form to allow his audio Light. shown or something. Light. So that's fine, whatever. Um, did you have a question, Charles? Uh, well, yeah, I guess. Um, so are they all working on the same code, or mm -hmm. do they all have their own? They have one, yeah, it's hard to see, sorry. So there's one laptop. Uh -huh. There are four students. There's this student, there's this student. There are actually two students okay. here that you can't quite see. Um, these two students sort of contribute the most. Um, this student chimes in from time to time. This student, I don't think, said much of anything. Are they required episode. to write their own individual codes? No, they write as a group. Okay. Yeah, they write as a group. Um, okay. So they negotiate together. What we try to do is we push them to move the computer around so that on days when computing is happening, different people are like yeah, driving the bus, essentially. Okay. Um, we do try to push people who have a lot of experience away from the computer as, and ask them to be like navigators for their Okay, so what happened was they basically their code is such that the, the satellite just kind of flies off to infinity and they can't figure out why. So the group begins to do some debugging, um, and it's led by the student on the left. Well, final momentum equals initial momentum plus net force times delta T. 
Yeah. 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 Okay. That's exactly what we have. So, this yeah. is not the problem. This is not the problem. Yeah. Final position is equal to initial position plus velocity times delta t. Velocity equals momentum over mass. <coughs> that's exactly what we have. So, that's not the problem. So they're going through sort of line by line and trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and the student on the left continues to mansplain the rest of the code, <laughs> and they can't find the mistake. So then he takes the computer away from the rest of the group um, while they're waiting for the TA to come over. And <laughs> So what it turns out happened, and this is like, this is such a boss move by the LA in this case. They had the whole thing wrong on the first day, and the LA let them go home with it wrong and come back and put the numbers in wrong, and then the code didn't work. And so they had to go back and do what they had done on the previous day, do the analysis correctly, realize that they were off by basically a factor about 100,000 because they had done something incorrectly, uh, and then put that in, and then it worked perfectly. Okay, um, so that's just a really like that's a pretty amazing instructional move on the part of the on the part of the LA that was in this class, but it led to us being able to sort of say okay well maybe here's a case for what students might do with debugging. So what Mike argued in the paper was that students have to recognize there's a bug, so there's no good reason for it to be moving in that direction, right? There's something that we can say is wrong. Um, then they take a strategic approach, or what Mike called a more strategic approach. Uh, final momentum equals initial momentum plus net force times delta t. True, so it goes line by line. Um, then they do what most of us do who write code. They start swearing at each other. Oh, wait, oh, God, did you change it? <laughs> right, so they take a much less strategic approach and just start changing things. Uh, hopefully, you've done all your Git check-ins at that point. And then you come to a resolution. You realize that there was a problem, what that problem was. It led you to do some new physics. Maybe that's a problem we didn't have the initial momentum correct. Right. So um, this for Mike was a really interesting case because it said, suggested that students might have different approaches to doing debugging. Uh, this is one particular case. Turns out that pretty much all of the cases that we found after that were in this bin. The reason that this one was in this bin was because the student on the far left ah. was a computer science senior and sort of had embodied those strategic approaches as his first approach, whereas most of the other students that we had did not have that experience, and so they were in this bin. So that made Mike a little sad. Um, and so he went back to this code and said, well, the thing that I'm seeing students really struggle with is writing this line of code. Um, this is the thing that they spend all their time on, and I want to understand how they do that. This line of code in math is this. This is the gravitational force, right? And they have to translate that into code. Um, and so Mike was interested in, well, how do they construct the direction vector associated with that? Because now they have to sort of navigate both the math and the sort of conceptual part of it and translate that into code. So what he's done is he's taken what's called a, a task analysis approach and tried to deconstruct what would be all the things that students would have to do to do this work, right? So they have to construct a separation vector, construct a unit vector, construct a net force, integrate the momentum. There's also subparts in here. This is just sort of high level writing of the stuff he's doing. What he used this for was to figure out where in the video he should be watching where students are doing this kind of work. Um, he's not saying that students do it this way, it's not linear like this at all. He's just saying, like, let me be able to frame the video, because two hours of students doing anything on video is really hard to watch, um, if anybody has done that. Um, so students in this episode that I'm going to show you have this line of code uh, written down. Um, and for those of you who speak math, it's this line of code, or the, it's this piece of math, right? So it is the magnitude of the gravitational force as written as a centripetal force equation. And it's not working uh, for a variety of reasons. So Shelley says, but um, wait, hold on, remember this. The uniform circular force is equal to the gravity force is equal to the net force. So we can just do what you did. She's talking about writing this equation down. Um, except instead of using the uniform circular motion equation, we use that gravity equation, which she points to sort of on the board. Um, and Joe says, yeah, Chuck says, oh yeah, that sounds good. So they recognize that like 
in this situation where they're doing a circular orbit, the gravitational force is the net force and it is equal to this sort of centripetal calculation. But what they should do is they should write something that kind of looks like this, which in math is that. But that's still the magnitude of the gravitational force and they're still having problems. So Chuck says, all right, we need to define a direction here. This seems to be the problem, right? Uh, Cody says, well, I don't know how to do that. Chuck says, well, isn't the direction like, here I'm gonna get four points on a circle, yada, yada, yada. What he does is he draws this with his group. So he draws this picture with the Earth here, the satellite at four different positions. This has to be the direction that it points. And then they write out this piece of pseudocode that they agree on, which is that the position of the satellite minus the position of the Earth divided by its magnitude should be the direction, which is pretty solid. So they end up writing that direction code, and they end up multiplying it, and then everything kind of works. Now, what Mike is finding that's interesting about this is that this approach is not unique. In fact, a number of students are actually using this kind of approach. And this approach comes from, we think, this homework problem that they did five days before, where they're asked to calculate the direction vector associated with a ABCD circle, right? So they're drawing on some piece of sort of physics and mathematics knowledge that they're doing in their pre-class homework to be able to solve this computational problem. So his argument, and this is the only sort of educational slide I have, is that these homework activities, if we can start to think about them, we can start putting students in what's called the zone of proximal development, namely that we have sort of helped them develop a level of confidence that aligns with the sort of challenge that we're asking them to engage with in the classroom, right? And this is sort of his first example of, of seeing that. So that is all I have to say about students. I'm going to shift gears for a moment, and then we're going to shift out of doing qualitative research as well. So any questions before we do that? OK. Right. So um, one of the big projects that we have is, well, actually, oh, go ahead, Just a quick question. Um, about the back presentation itself. Oh, yeah. um, I, and with the group projects outside of class, are they required to do uh, their own coding alone as individ like individually and then return? Or no. is it just in class? It's just, just in class. It's just in class right now. That's how okay. we do it right now. Yeah. Um, we are moving to a course that will have more uh, class time. So it'll be, it'll be uh, six hours instead of four, which means it's four, five credits instead of four. When we do that, we're going to start thinking about how to do more stuff outside of class with them like that mm -hmm. um, because we can start asking more of the laboratory piece to fit outside of the class. So how are you assessing how students are learning? I mean, if this is about computation. Yeah. How are you assessing how they're learning individually? Right. Because like in this yeah. past group, you've got the one person you can tell that he is probably more senior, and yeah. the others are listening to what he is having to say Absolutely. about the code. Yeah. But how do you assess yeah. how they're learning? So we have um, we have homework problems that they do after class mm -hmm. um, that have some computing in them. Mm -hmm. Um, we also have exam questions that have computing in them, not where they actually compute, but where they read code and they alter it in pencil and paper or they identify parts of it. So the goals that we have are not to teach them all how to program, right? The goals we have are for them to identify like what that code is doing, explain how they know that it's doing the thing that it's doing, explain how they would change it if they were modeling some other system and so forth. So, so it's a more of a, of a conceptual computational physics as opposed to like programming. Okay, uh, so we're also studying sort of this high level, right, of how students are taught computation. That's looking at departments and faculty. Um, so what we've done is we've developed a survey, which some folks here might have filled out. I actually don't know. Um, essentially, what we've done is we've given a survey to a bunch of faculty across the country um, and asked them about their experience with computing, their, their department's plans for it, um, how they use it, um, you know, what strategy they use for teaching it, and so forth. Um, and uh, if they don't, then, you know, sort of other things about why they do not, and so forth. Um, the idea behind this is that we want to be able to sort of give this survey uh, every few years to sort of track how those changes uh, happen over time. Uh, we're working with the American Institute of Physics on this, so they helped us to design the survey, um, and they are also interested in continuing, continually offering it. Um, so what we've done is we've sampled 357 departments. Um, to give you a sense of that, there are 760-ish departments across the country that offer a bachelor's degree in physics. Um, but we are only sampling about a quarter of them because about half of this number is two-year colleges. Um, 
what we did is we randomly sampled departments and then we emailed every single faculty member in the department and we got whatever response we got, which is what we got about 1,300 faculty responding. Okay? So um, with that, what we have to do is be able to say something about you know, what fraction of people are showing up in this data set. And so I'm going to unpack this slide for you for a minute because it will repeat multiple times. So the, one of the first questions we ask people is, do you have experience teaching computation? Now, here we took a very generous definition of computation because AIP encouraged us to. They encouraged us to define it, but also to take a generous definition, right, which includes using simulations, having students work with simulations, writing code from scratch, and so forth. So this is, I would say, probably a very high upper limit um, on this. The other reason I think it's also a high upper limit is because the people who tend to respond to the survey are people who are interested in computing anyway. Right, so, so take all of these numbers as sort of a, a high upper limit. Now, the other thing to say here is um, I'm trying to plot the number of departments, and we sample faculty within those departments. Now, the reason I'm plotting number of departments is because, you know, if we sampled um, Texas Tech, right, there's 25, 30-ish faculty. We sample MIT, there's 70-ish faculty. We, we go down the street and, you know, to St. Edwards, and there's three or something, right? Like, so. So thinking about how people would respond and to say what is the number of departments that are doing this as opposed to the number of faculty seems more important. So the upper bar is did one person from that department say they do the thing, right? So that's a very high upper limit. And this was did 50% or more of the responding people say it, right? So this we took a sort of general consensus of the department that it was done, okay? So this is always lower than that, right? Make sense? Okay. So roughly 50% of departments or so say they, there's some experience there teaching computation to students. Okay, that's, that's sort of the upshot of this slide. I know we spent a lot of time unpacking it, but it's important for the other ones. Cool? All right. So then we asked them, well, in which courses are you teaching computation? And so we asked them about introductory physics courses and advanced physics courses. And so folks tend to say um, they're, uh, they're, they're split on this, but there's also no sort of difference statistical difference between whether those, it's taught in intro courses or advanced courses. Where, where do you delineate between intro and advanced? Yeah, we refer to advanced courses as courses for majors, I believe, and introductory courses as general introductory courses for science and engineering, I think is what he said, something like that. So if you can think of it as your, like your calculus-based course, intro course, and then all of your other courses oh. that are for majors. Oh. So, Nice. I mean, there's still there's a lot there's a lot of room there to, to sort of help people do this work, right? That's what's kind of interesting. Um, if you look at formal programs that people offer in their departments, um, there are very few departments that seem to offer computational physics degrees, and there's very few departments that offer it as a minor. Um, so, in terms of advertising formal programs or formal preparation, we have some work to do there. Uh, the other thing I think that's actually really interesting about this, which is where sort of I think this is to me is curious. There's a big discrepancy in one person saying that they do this and 50% or more, meaning that faculty in their departments have no idea what's going on in their own departments. Like, do we have a computational thing? I don't know. Maybe. Right? This seems problematic for a ver okay, we'll move on. It seems problematic. Okay. Um, if we look at different kinds of instructional strategies people are using, we ask them if they use it on homework. On projects, it tends to be that they use it in their homework or on projects. They're giving the students homework questions or they're having them do longer term projects. Um, we don't see a lot of folks using interactive activities, the kind that you would ex sort of expect from sort of a PER driven standpoint. We also don't see it showing up on the examinations or assessment kinds of things that are not projects. Um, so this is just sort of broad areas that we do or don't, don't see people reporting that they're using it. Okay? So what that tells us is there's a few things we can take away from this. A majority of faculty seem to report that they have experience teaching people computation, right? Um, it also seems to be more prevalent than it was in the past. This study was done about 10 years ago, and it was closer to like 10% of departments had some computing being taught in intro or advanced courses. So there's some growth there, which is nice to see. Um, we seem to be lacking formal programs in it, though. So our departments maybe can think about that. Like, should we be offering formal programs? How are we advertising? How do we make sure everyone in our department knows that we're doing it? Um, and then there's a need to sort of explore these interactive methods and how we assess it, which I think are really key areas to sort of help people know what they're doing. Now, the last thing I'll, I want to kind of end with is 
whether we can learn more from this data, right? So this is the way that AIP likes to do these studies. They like to have these graphs that just kind of show you sort of these are the facts, right? Um, and I like to make inferences about this. So I'd like to model this data in some way and be able to say something about what should I be paying attention to, what should be, what's important here. So um, we are starting to pilot these um, supervised learning techniques, uh, machine learning techniques. Uh, the one that we're using right now is called a random forest. Um, we can unpack that later if you want. But the point being is that there are some pieces of data that are predictive of whether people teach computing or not, or whether people report they have experience teaching computing or not. And so we'd like to know what are the important factors that suggest this. Now, the reason we're not using things like linear correlation or, or factor analysis or what have you is a lot of those are grounded on sort of a continuity of your data and that the data has very similar kinds of scales. When it comes to the survey that we gave, because AIP helped us design it, it has a wide variety of scales. It has a lot of binary questions. Um, it has you know, some multimodal questions like, you know, when, in which year did you get your PhD? Um, combined with, you know, do you do this or do you not? Um, and so that makes it a much more of a data science or machine learning kind of problem, okay? Um, so what you need to use this technique is a binary classification. So we ask the question, do people teach computing or not? Right? That is a binary classification problem that we could solve. Um, so then what we do is you sort of segregate your data um, and you separate it from a piece of data that you want to test on. You train your model on that data and then you say, okay, how good does it do on this sequestered data set that it has never seen? And this is an old graph, but it, it, it makes a point. Um, it turns out that it does okay. Um, so we're, we're, we're hitting about 75%, 80% uh, accuracy. With, We've been tuning our models and, and doing actually better with it lately. Um, but the point is, is that this is essentially showing you, like, are you getting false positives and false negatives, which would be sort of the off-diagonal elements versus true positives and true negatives. So this would be the sequestered data and comparing it. Um, what is more interesting to us are the things that are most predictive of these outcomes. And so this is a listing of them at the time that we did this first pass on the analysis. Um, and this measure here is the Gini importance. I'm not going to unpack that for you. Just think of it as some measure of importance. Um, but the thing that shows up as being sort of the most important is the time to degree. Basically, when did somebody earn their PhD? Um, type of institution, whether I use computational research with my students, faculty rank, those all seem to be kind of important. Whether the institution is an HBCU or not doesn't seem to matter. Okay? So I'm going to show you examples of why, that, why it shows up in the way that it does. So here's some binned data, just because it's easier to see. Um, so the blue bars, the ones on the left, are people reporting that they have experience teaching students computation. The green ones on the right are those that don't, and they're binned by every five years. And what you can see is that the blue bars, the yeses, start to get bigger right after the introduction of the personal computer. And they stay kind of big compared to the green ones until the people who are becoming faculty like right now, right? So there's maybe an interesting story here about you know, people's preparation, how they do their research, also maybe how busy junior faculty are. I mean, these are all things we're reading into this, but it's not something that we can say. All we can say is that this is, seems to be an effect. Um, and so we should maybe look into that a little bit more. The other thing, oh, go ahead. Do you have data on whether the faculty who were hired in the 80s taught it in their first five years? Oh, no, we do not. That's a, that's a because it might just be that it, this is something that gets assigned to people who have yeah. tenure and so on. Or. Well, so this actually, let me show you this. Okay. So here is uh, a faculty rank. So what you see here is that people who are full professors, associate professors, and assistant professors tend to report that they have experience teaching computation to students, whereas lecturers, adjunct faculty, visiting people, so forth, do not. Now, there's a lot of, to read into this, I think, um, and it would be interesting to try to study it. One is that um, people who have more power in their department, you know, people who have more power over their own future, uh, you know, tend to do this kind of thing, maybe. The other thing is that people who are in this bin tend to be active in research, um, and so maybe they're using it a lot in their own research, and they're like, oh, maybe I should bring this into my class. Um, that doesn't really explain this one, but... But there are things going on here, right, that are interesting. Like, why do you see this difference in these ranks? Uh, and, and how can we explain that from, you know, power dynamics or people's previous experiences or so forth? Yeah. Also, <coughs> different ranks have choices of what they get to teach. That is correct, yeah. 
yeah, depending on your department, you might not be uh, able to teach an advanced physics course as an assistant professor. Uh, our department doesn't do that, but I know that there are departments that do. Um, here's just for comparison, here's the HBCU, not, not HBCU, right? And you see no difference in the, in the height of the graphs here, right? So, um, so this is be something that wouldn't have much of an effect. Now, uh, just really quickly, I want to put these things up. We actually have concerns about this, and we're, we're addressing them, but we're, we're sort of tuning our model. The big part of machine learning is tuning the parameters you use, understanding the algorithms you're using. Um, so we get a lot of false classifications when the data is biased. Um, and the data is biased because fewer people report that they teach computing than do not. Um, so we can bootstrap things. We can deal with it that way. Um, most important features in the algorithm that we're currently using, the voting algorithm we're using, tend to have more degrees of freedom, right? So the thing that showed up was the thing that had the most degrees of freedom. Um, you can actually alter the training algorithm. You can alter the way voting happens to penalize uh, uh, data that has a wide variation. So we're, we're investigating that as well. And we're wondering also if the results are tied to a specific algorithm. There are other ones that we might be able to use, and we're sort of investigating that as well as a way of comparing sort of how these things do these predictions. So that is all I got. I want to say a couple of quick things really fast. First, um, our department is now trying to teach computation. We have a, we have a five-year plan we're putting together to integrate computation into all of our major courses, the core major courses, classical mechanics, the you know, quantum, stat back, and so forth. Um, we are now requiring a computational science prerequisite. We are fortunate to have um, a computational science department that offers an introduction to data science and modeling as, a, as their introductory course. That is now required for our majors prior to taking classical mechanics, which would be the first major course. Um, so uh, this is going to be something that we're going to be working on over the next four or five years. So with that, I will thank you and ask for any additional questions. Thank you. Can you go back to the slide for the, uh, about the uh, professorship. Yeah. That, that is pretty fascinating. Um, did you, by chance, do any kind of like uh, statistical inferences on it to see if there are any differences amongst? I mean, we can see there's. A, it seems like there's a trend, but is it statistically significant? Yes. Yeah, it is. So we um, we can do what's called a um, a contingency table analysis, which mm -hmm. is a very simple sort of chi squared test, just to see if there's an association between yes and no in rank. Um, we haven't gone and done like a pair a set of pairwise tests. Um, because, you know, essentially, there's a lot more that's interesting about this than we really could explain in a fact. Like, it's a measurable effect that we can see, some association with, but, but you need qualitative work to unpack why you see this difference. Like, we're not going to get it from doing more Did you collect qualitative data with this? No. Um, no, no this yeah, it's just binary. It's just, it's just uh, people filling out a survey. We do have some open-ended responses to questions that we could, like, look at, but um, they're it depends on what area of the survey they ended up filling out. Yeah. Those, so those were all optional, so they so a lot of people didn't even fill them out. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, I'm also wondering the the previous slide where you had the PhD year. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I'm wondering if a part of that too is just the people who got their PhD in 2011 to 2015. If they're in faculty positions at all, they've probably only been in them for one or two years. Right and they probably haven't cycled yeah. through the set of courses they'll teach in a fairly quick amount of time. That is true. Also, I would, I would argue um, that these, these folks uh, also tend to show up more, sorry, tend to show up more frequently in these yes. bins um, than the people that are farther down the line, right? So there, there's, a, there's interaction effects, too, of, of what I'm presenting to you, right? Um, and so, like, this is where you start to look at the sort of intersection of these things and say, okay, well, who are people that have these kinds of profiles, and I should go talk to them about this to understand more deeply what's going on. Yeah. Did you by chance look at how many, uh, well, I, uh, how many departments are, if departments are becoming more involved with computation or putting it into their courses over the years, like a trend, of, are you looking at that as if, Oh, the, so the only thing we have, we actually have just two measurements, so there's a line that shows it's going to hit 100% in four years. Four? <laughs> four, <laughs> four years. <laughs> <laughs> it's going from the 10 to 25% or something in a 10-year period, so we're just extrapolating out from okay. there, right? Just a straight line. Okay. But that's the only two measurements that have actually been made. All right. yeah. So do you think you would see 
similar similar figure if you ask the question, do you have experience teaching majors versus non-majors? That's a good question. Um, so part of that is probably in here. Um, in this guy, right? Um, so part of it is like, I don't have experience teaching the advanced courses, so I'm going to say no. But the other part of it is like, I don't teach computation in the advanced courses, so I'm also going to say no. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the survey that we asked, no, we didn't do that. Um, but in terms of the answer to your question, yes, that is that is probably entangled in here. Yeah. Um, so I think that could be the first question you could attempt to parse some of the bigger questions. Yeah, so I, I would say, well, just as if people are thinking about doing this kind of stuff, um, working with like a professional organization like AIP is phenomenal. Like they are so good at doing this. They're so good at preparing it. They're so good at validating the work. But they also have a very specific way that they want questions asked. Um, and those kinds of deeper questions, like they bristle out a little bit. Um, and I think part of that is because they are very used to reporting just the facts in this way. We'd say this, we're going to say this in one sentence. Um, and the modeling of the data is not never something that they would do. And so that's the, there's a tension, there was, there was definitely a tension there in designing the survey with them of like, well, we want to know this. And they're like, no. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, so this, act, this result actually seems a little bit counterintuitive counterintuitive mm -hmm. to me um, because I don't I, and perhaps the uh, perhaps the way that they're uh, expressing computation um, it varies a yes. lot in between yeah. instructors Absolutely. Uh, but I'm, I'm trying to remember the last time I saw an introductory physics course uh, with a computer lab for each individual person in there yeah so or even one for a team yeah like that I mean I, I, I I don't know if that's a, a barrier to entry, possibly, as well, that you might want to explore, um, where it's simply that the, that the equipment resources aren't, aren't something that have, have been, uh, but I mean, maybe that's something that's being counteracted by personal computing and laptops and that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, I think, so I think you could, there's, a, there's an excellent question there of access, which is, like, how do you ensure accessibility, not just in the sense of like this being accessible to folks who may present disabilities, but also folks who have financial uh, situations, right? Like, how do you provide that access? Um, I have been fortunate to work at research intensive universities that have the amount of funding to be able to support it through like buying computers for the classroom or what have you. Um, but I think it's a very important question about like other institutions or other situations where you're. We don't have that access. Yeah, I, I would completely. Thank you Sorry. so much. We're running short on time. Um, we've already gone over, but uh, if you guys would like to stay and discuss, I'm sure you could answer a few more questions. Um, but why don't you go ahead and help me? Thank you.